So, it's good to be back in Billings. It's great to see the building in the snow once again. I know there is a summer and it will come, but it's nice that you made a spring day for me. So, what I'd like to talk about today is really the, you know, how do things like this library happen? How do communities, because buildings are part of what really gives the armature to the people, the ideas, the beliefs, the history, the memories, the stories of a place. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today and go through some basics. One of the interesting first things that an architect really has to be good at is an architect has to be a listener. Because without listening, we cannot really get at anything new, at anything interesting. I'm not interested in bringing my style or my manner or my ability to, to make things particularly to a place. I'm interested in bringing my curiosity to listen and find out what that place is. This building is a pretty good case study of that, and I'm not going to vary outside almost the walls of this building except to the horizon that's around us in the rim rocks. So let's go. I see some familiar faces out here that know more of the story, but I'm going to assume a lot of you don't. And every story about a building is a unique story. So designing by celebrating the context. The context is the city. It's that landscape out there. It's all of those things. But buildings are not just about context, they're about all the people. And that's what really makes it happen. Now, I've been to Billings a few times before I got this call. And I was standing outside of Bill Clinton's favorite barbecue joint in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I got a call from Billings, Montana, back in the fall of 2010. He was the director of the foundation here. And they had had an amazing gift given to your community which was a gentleman, anonymous, we call him Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith loved architecture, loved his place. This place was good to him. And he wanted to put forward because he knew the city desperately needed a new place for its library. A library in the changing 21st century where it's not just about books, but it's also about knowledge and digital in this whole world. This man had put up $2 million to pay for all the things related to the design services and the architecture to happen the soft costs, if you will. An amazing gift. So that was a kickoff that was a bit different. So I'm hearing this story, and she said, we're on the search for architects, and we got your name, and you're on a list. A list I didn't even know existed for what. So I was pretty jazzed and pretty excited. Having been here, I had memories, but I never go and predetermine anything in a place. And so I wanted to start with fresh grounding. And I asked Leslie, I said, what is what you would think is the most important thing of the physical environment of Billings, Montana to you and your neighbors, what would, what would come to your mind first off? And lo and behold, that rim rock view that you see, the rim rocks that surround this community where the prairie meets the mountains, that was the physical point of pride. There wasn't particularly a building. There was a historic house here and an old library there and things like that. But it was that geology and what made that substance that framed this place uniquely. I would not forget that. Now, the original library over here, the old Parmley Billings Library, the first one, not the most recent one, it was built on that premise. And if you look in the images that I put together here, you can see how that rusticated stone building of that old library built in the late 19th century, early 20th century, was capturing that essence of materiality and place and form making. It has a certain historic style to it, but it was its materiality that gave it its appropriate place. Now, the other thing I believe is that there's two things in making a building really work. It's pragmatism and it's poetry. You can't have one without the other to make architecture. Now, if something's just functional, and it just works, that's, that's, that's good. It has to work, OK? Because nobody can like a beautiful building if it doesn't work. But also, if there isn't poetry there, if there isn't the magic that we know from our life experiences and mankind and culture, that when you walk into these great spaces, the hair on the back of your neck, sort of, something happens. There's something that you can't translate into anything that's logical. That's poetry. Now, in this day and age of all kinds of changing styles every other day, there's a lot of what are called star architects. And they too much depend on that poetry and somewhat function be damned. I'm of that breed that believes when you have a scale and you put poetry and pragmatism on a balance, when they balance out, that's not just art. That's not just engineering. That's architecture. So that's where we are coming from. And as we look at this idea of pragmatism and poetry, we'll talk with, start with the little thing first. And we're going to look at the 
idea of coming from the outside in here a little bit, but we'll get that out in a moment. These are little details that make a difference. The first day I was back in Billings in November 10th of 2010 to sort of have a conversation about this possibility, I walked by the dude, okay? The dude is a little motel about 250 feet from here. It was very funny because that's where I stayed for my whole tour of duty for the last three years and I was there last night. I have a window with the view at the library site and now I can see the, the library as it is. But it has this weeping mortar and I thought, what a wonderful metaphor. It's a really good building. That's an honest, timeless, modern, ranching building. Optimism in the 50s, people are traveling. And to take its city-fied brick and make it of the place, it weeped the mortar. And it has this rustic quality that's really almost like those rim rocks. And so our block, as well as the stone that you see, starting to take form on our courtyard out here. It's that memory of place. So that's a pragmatic idea of masonry, a poetic idea of how you interpret and gain the geology. Another thing that I noticed here is, again, Montana is a very, at one level, basic, it's a homesteader place. Things grew from the land. And I got all excited very early on in my journeys across this landscape with pole barns. They had such dignity, they had such character, they had such elegance, and they spoke to the values of the place. And so on one level, this library is the poetic side of a pole barn. But that's giving you the roots of how it started, started to take form. But buildings really work two ways. They come from the inside out as you design and think about them, and then they'll reverse themselves and come from the outside in. Now from the inside out portion, that's about the people. So it's the first man, Mr. Smith, at one level, but that predated all the librarians, all the use of this facility for years and years, and the, the following and the constituency it had. And we needed a lot more than just one man's vision and one man's commitment to really put something out there. And so there was a bond issue raised, and we got some of our key supporters there waving their signs in the center. And with the confidence of the generosity of one man, a community was inspired by the ideas that they heard and the conversation they were being engaged in by a design team, by an architect, to really listen and see what could happen. And so suddenly there was this groundswell, and in the fall of 2011, this was the only election that was held anywhere in America where a library bond issue passed. The pride of place, the context of this community a coming of age of something that was desired, was already loved, but we had the need. So as we developed and evolved things from the conversations with a number of groups, and we talked everything from the users of the library, to the home education folks, to a group of teenagers, to the homeless, to the business people, the executives, to the leaders, to the, the politicians, and of course the librarians, and that was all part of this dialogue, and that's what listening's about. And from that listening, what evolves is some numbers, some relationships, some I've got to have, I want to have, I should have, I hadn't thought about that. And you can start mapping, if you will, through these diagrams and data, how a building takes shape. So that's those inward driving forces of expectations. Now a lot of people, the question came up as in our first speaker, of we're going to do this beautiful place for those people? Well, this place is their home and their building as well. And libraries are unique in America in that the Carnegie Library gift, back more than a century ago, was to bring libraries to America, which had so much to do with our growing and becoming the great country we are. And again, the library is the home of free speech and home of access to information and home to everybody's concern because this is where dreams are made, realities take hold, vacations are planned, futures are changed, Libraries will never lose that. As we can see in this building, the, the book and the paper is as important as sitting at that computer terminal. So libraries are really an exciting building type for an architect to do. So now we're gonna talk about from the outside in. We saw the rim rocks. We see them referenced on this map of your town. And we look at the geography. I and mean, it's a really interesting mix right now because this is a town that was film formed, filmed and formed on a river. And the alignment of the railroad that came here, when it was homesteaded originally, followed the line of that river. And the first grid of the downtown, where we are sitting in, right off center of, right here, is at that weird rotation that is about the land and the geography forming the place. 
It's not about Mr. Jefferson's grid, president and architect that we had a long time ago, and he was an architect as much as a great president, and he gave us this grid of America on a north-south axis. And when I came here, I immediately noticed the importance of that rotation. Because what's unique with the site of our library being in downtown Billings, Montana, is that it's at this akimbo angle. So it has four sides to the sun. You talk about designing a building in this hemisphere where the south is where the sun comes, and if you're designing a sustainable energy building, that's where you gain your sun. Turn that on akimbo, and everything changes. So it's a different building than a building that sits in, in, a, in a grid of north, north, south, east, west. So that would come to bear. We found very quickly in the mapping of it, as you look at this thing, we're always interested in how a city lives and walks. So we've got circles out from this building of where you can get in a 10-minute walk, a three-minute walk, a five-minute walk. You can imagine what a 20-minute bike ride does for you. We're at the center of transit. This is like the perfect urban place for a library in Montana's truly urban town. Along with this, we knew that we wanted to be sustainable and green because that is the world we're living in and there are issues and we have to be responsible to our future if we're all going to exist in comfort and sustainability and the future. And so we look at sun angles and we look at the direction of the wind and the sun angle again is affected here because that is northeast, that is southeast. When I looked out my window at the dude this morning, I saw the sun rising on this building on this wonderful winter's day. And it dances through in the afternoon, we'll get sun already coming in from the northwest. Now, it's about the immediate context. So you walk down Broadway. This is a proud, wonderful city that has a great heritage of a built tradition. There's a tradition of masonry, there's a, a fine scale. It would you know, follow up the great main streets of, of this part as it developed and evolved in the early 20th century. And again, there's been care and restoration. There's a grain to it, and whether it's standing next to a window frame or a clear story or looking at the brick or the terracotta, this place has architecture. It's making that fabric. So that's an important part of the context. Now, on that November day in 2011 when I arrived here, it was the night of the first big rainstorm or snowstorm. It came in rain, woke up in snow, ice under that snow. You know what that's all about. And I looked out of my hotel window. That was my view, and I saw a lot of long buildings down by the railroad tracks, long sort of sheds, pole barns, if you will. And again, a library is nothing but a very flexible building for the needs of knowledge. And if there's one thing about a library when you're an architect, it's to realize that it has to be very flexible because change is the inevitable. It isn't anything new just with the computer. It's constantly changing. So there's sort of a model in these simple shell-type buildings. And that, was, that was interesting. And then back to the elegance of the architecture of the place, the old train station down on Montana, a nice, beautiful, long building, as good an architecture, again, as you'll find in the West. So we started doodling, we started thinking, we met with the planning director, and we talked about the whole idea of we're on 6th, we've got this energy at the center. And the planning director was the impetus, and that little doodle up there on the left was at a meeting with the planning director above the old library next door. And she wanted a front door, not just on the front, but a building without a back. And I'm fine with that, because buildings shouldn't have fronts and backs. So we have our entry that we've gotten a lot of practice using right now in the transition over on the northwest. And we have our new entry that we're just starting to enjoy. So that was part of the siding diagram. I looked at the idea that, again, we are an auto culture. And while you do have transit, you do have all those things that will help as we look for the best and most sustainable building. We'll have bike racks, we have, like I say, good connectivity, but we do drive in cars in the West because there is a scale delta that we, we just deal with with an automobile. But they're becoming more sustainable and they're becoming electric and they're becoming all these things, so that's, that's good. But what we, what we set up for and what this field of dreams is to our, our southeast here is going to be a parking garden. So come spring, the place will be paved, there'll be curves and walks and bike racks and extensive landscaping such that there will be a park buffer and it will be the building in the park. So we're pretty excited about that. When we started talking about this thing, there was the ambition, some of you have heard about LEED ratings, it's a scoring system for certification. And there was the ambition of, uh, we have to be at least LEED silver. You know, there's LEED certified, then there's silver. But again, if you're gonna really be sustainable, you can only shoot for the top, and that's platinum. That's the top where you should be going. And we set that goal way back in the beginning in 2011. And as soon as we get our site work done with local materials that we're using, we 
believe very securely right now that we will be a lead platinum, have the best rating that anybody can have on the planet with that system of rating our sustainability and be an example to the entire community. So that's pretty exciting. But back in our first sketches and our first models, you can see how we have solar collectors on the roof. We have this whole idea of a pavilion of light, pavilion of view, if you will, that looks beyond November 14th, 2011. That's what the streets look like that day. All plans of a side trip to Red Lodge and other things for my wife and I on that first visit were gone. It was fun enough to walk around the streets here on the ice and snow, much less drive the, the back roads of Montana. But we got to really think and understand things, and that's what it was a, a few minutes ago. So that became an image of an idea about this place. That becomes the reality. Changing, evolving all the time. Today's pictures look different than last year's pictures. And again, the idea of daylight flexibility, celebration, the fast in out of almost the, the contemporary culture on the first level, the great children's setting, the skylight, the connection, the flow, the flexibility. The teens, we have invited the teens into the library as stakeholders of value and merit. They have the prime location of the southeast corner. You see them there, they engage it, and on their way to their place, they discover all the wonders of the library. A room with a view. These two little girls last year looking out those windows that we created about that idea that your point of pride was those rim rocks. And that's what they're seeing. And again, what would a building be, a library be, without a great story space? A silly old architect that's willing to roll on the floors with the kids. <laughs> that building's about memory. We look in this room, the walls of this room are the snow fences of Montana. We have the stone from the, the ledge up there. We have the reused claimed book from the underwriter's auto dealership. All these things playing into the language, but on the left we have our old building, and the tip and top of the story cone, if you haven't been in it, please check it out before you leave today, is the exact height of the old library. And so when we look at the horizon of our memories, and look into the distance and dream with the vision of ideas, we can lay on the floor and look at the sky and dream about things that haven't happened. And when you're a three-year-old or four-year-old, two-year-old, hearing your first story time, that will be a memory that'll hold, and someday you will bring your grandchildren to lay on the floor with them in that story cone. So the architecture of context and community is what I'm interested in. Its timelessness is what I aspire to. I'm interested in challenge you to see something you haven't seen before by the ability of architecture to give us a new way to look at things. Thank you very much.